course, National Geographic should celebrate the 200th anniversary of Darwin's birth. Darwin is arguably the most important thinker who ever lived. One would um, put, up, put him up with Einstein, with Newton, with Galileo. He, he's up there. We once thought we were, were the pinnacle of, of creation made in God's image. We now know that we are cousins of 10 million other species, perhaps a billion other species if you count all the ones that have gone extinct. We are a tiny twig in a vast bush. There's nothing special about us in terms of the order of creation. There are various special things about us, like we're cleverer than other, other species and we have language. Um, but nevertheless, we are just cousins of all other living creatures. Darwin told us why we exist, and that's not an easy qu question to answer, because it's not just us, it's all living things, and that means everything complicated, because the living world is staggeringly complex, staggeringly improbable unless you understand where it came from. It looks as though it's been designed. Everybody thought it was designed. Darwin showed that it wasn't. That's the importance of Darwin. The human race has had a number of, of humiliations in a way. I mean, we, we discovered from Copernicus, Galileo, that the world is not the center of the universe. And now we know that even the galaxy that we're in is not the center of the universe, let alone the solar system. Darwin did the same thing for, for us, for living creatures. Darwin has caused possibly the biggest revolution in humanity's ideas of its own nature. Fossils are not necessary nowadays to demonstrate the, the fact of evolution. We could do that on purely comparative evidence, especially biochemical, molecular evidence. But fossils are very nice for showing the, the actual history of life, the actual history that evolution took. Fossils are the only direct evidence we have of what animals were like in the distant past. If we needed any more evidence, then fossils of creatures like whales would be very powerful. But as it happens, the fossil record for whales is very strong. We now know that the closest cousins to whales are actually hippos, oddly enough. I wouldn't have thought that, but they are. Um, and so something, it wouldn't have been like a hippo, but it would have been something like a sort of common ancestor of a hippo and a whale. <laughs> took to the water, I suppose a bit like hippos do, and then gradually became more and more wedded to the water until finally they never left the water as whales don't. The fossil record is now very good, mostly from fossils in Pakistan, especially uh, recently discovered ones. It's a beautiful series where the hind limbs gradually disappear. I mean, the ancestors, of course, galloped along on, on four legs and then the hind limbs gradually disappeared. Now there's a tiny vestige of hind limb uh, skeleton buried deep inside the, the whale, which, I mean, what else could that be? But evidence for the evolution of whales as marine animals from land animals. There's not the slightest doubt that marine whales are descended from uh, land animals, and the fossil record proves it utterly. There is no doubt at all that Darwin was right, that evolution happened, that we are descended from um, simpler animals, that we're descended from bacteria ultimately, that we, ha we are cousins of chimpanzees, cousins of monkeys. Darwin wasn't right about everything. I mean, he got his genetics wrong. Uh, there wasn't enough about, known about genetics at the time. But the essential point that we are direct cousins of monkeys and kangaroos and octopuses and bacteria is beyond all possible doubt. If you look at the way animals are dispersed on islands, on continents, they are in exactly the places you'd expect them to be if evolution had happened. Why are the islands around South America populated by animals that are South American except with minor variations? It's exactly the way you'd expect if animals occasionally drift across from the continent to an island and then start evolving, start changing, once they get there. Um, it's not the way it would be if God had gone around uh, creating animals wherever he felt like. Why on earth would he deliberately create animals in exactly the places 
where he would have created them in order to give the false impression that evolution had happened. And that's one kind of um, knockdown evidence. Another kind is if you look comparatively at different animals, especially biochemically, if you look at molecules in, uh, and how they differ from animal to animal, or from plant to plant for that matter, you find a hierarchical pattern of resemblance which only makes sense if you assume that it's a family tree. What we're looking at here is a pedigree. Everything, all the evidence, points to this being a pedigree. And once again, the only way you could save your creationism is to assume that God deliberately deceived us by planting molecules in exactly the places in the animal kingdom you would expect to see them if evolution had happened. Anybody who thinks that the world is less than 10,000 years old is an enormous number of creationists, especially in America, but not only in America, do think. Uh, the best excuse for them is lamentable ignorance. Ignorance is no crime, uh, but it, it's something to be remedied by education. Anybody who is not ignorant, anybody who's been shown the facts and still believes the world is less than 10,000 years old, there's got to be something wrong with them. The, to give an idea of the magnitude of the error to believe that the world is less than 10,000 years old, given that we know the world is actually 4.6 billion years old, it's equivalent to believing that the width of North America, right across from New York to San Francisco, is less than 10 yards. And that's the scale of the error we're talking about. So you've either got to be staggeringly ignorant, which most of them are, or if you're not ignorant, you've got to be insane. I think that religious upbringing is immensely powerful, and if it's hammered into you as a young child, it can be really quite difficult to get rid of in later life, especially if, when you were a child, you were told, the devil will come and will try to persuade you of error, remain steadfast, don't listen. Um, sometimes they were even told things like, don't believe when people bring something they call evidence. Faith is more important than evidence. I mean, it's really a, a, a really appalling stranglehold that these archaic beliefs have on minds that have been warped since childhood. It's such a privilege to understand where we come from, a privilege that's granted to those of us who live after 1859, uh, that to deny children that privilege is wicked. Uh, it's um, a deprivation which should not be visited on any child when the truth is so staggeringly exciting. It really is an enormously exciting thought that we are cousins of all living creatures, that we have a history of four billion years of slow, gradual evolution. Just think about four billion years of slow, gradual history. That's not something we can easily take on board. But the effort of doing so is well worth it. It's such a, a beautiful thought that we are the heirs of four billion years of evil, maybe 3.5 billion years of evolution, and that we are cousins of all living things. When you put that against the measly, piddling little ideas that are in Genesis, it's just no comparison. And it's a, a sad and diminishing deprivation of a child's opportunities to be denied that knowledge. I can think of no positive evidence for any kind of intelligent or divine design, neither in human consciousness, which is a mysterious phenomenon, we need an explanation for it, maybe one day we'll get it, but it's not going to be helped by uh, postulating anything supernatural. Similarly, you might think that the origin of the whole universe um, requires some sort of intelligence. Once again, it's a deeply mysterious problem, the origin of the universe, physicists are working on it, but Certainly, that won't be helped by postulating a supernatural intelligence, because to postulate that merely raises bigger questions than it answers. The reason I'm convinced that God doesn't exist is, well, I'm not really convinced God doesn't exist. I, I simply turn it around and say, there is no positive reason to think that God does exist. And therefore, although God might exist, he is no more likely to exist than the tooth fairy or pink unicorns. And so, why bother to believe in something for which there's not a shred of evidence when there's so much for which there is a great deal of evidence, and you could spend a lifetime finding out about it. Has human evolution come to an end? Uh, nobody knows. Um, if you 
look at the way natural selection ordinarily happens, the most fit creatures are the ones that have the most offspring by definition, and the reason they have the most offspring is that they're good at something. Over the past two or three million years, humans have got bigger and bigger brains, uh, presumably because individuals with bigger brains survive better. That would be natural selection. There's no reason to suppose that to, in today's world, the individuals with the biggest brains survive best or indeed reproduce most uh, fecundly. Um, so there's no reason to suppose that the same natural selection forces are going on today. I, I think in a couple of million years' time, humans will probably be extinct. But that's only based upon the fact that most species do go extinct. Um, and it's possible that we may have evolved into something else, especially if we colonize other, other, other worlds. Then you probably would expect that natural selection would start, um, uh, that species would start diverging because there'd be very little gene flow between the various colonies.